Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. So great to see you. I'm going to offer also a special word of welcome to all of our guests who are here. A great crowd, and you guys sound awesome today. So way to go, way to go. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord, just worshiping together? You know, through the years uh, as a pastor, um, I've done lots of weddings. And what happens here, you know, in our chapel or in our sanctuary, generally we have weddings here as well. But often there, there's really kind of a two-level uh, piece to the to the ceremony. There's a kind of the lower platform or on the floor, and then you kind of move to the upper platform. But what happens on the lower platform is, uh, if you've ever been to a wedding or you've been married, it went something like this, where uh, the groom and pastor comes in, the groom's standing beside me, right to my left, and we're kind of looking down there. He's shaking in his boots, right? And he's like all nervous. And um, I've had, there's other stories about grooms that have been real nervous and we've had to just press through. But um, he'll look back, he'll look back and, and we see her sort of, but then the doors in the back swing open and, you know, then the music kicks in and, uh, and he's about to pass out. And usually I'm kind of about to pass out myself because it is an awesome moment. Here comes the bride. She comes uh, with, her, with her dad, generally, right? Dad is walking her down the aisle. Now, he's instructed then to turn and stand beside uh, the father of the bride. Okay, so you, you catch this, right? The, uh, I'm standing here. The bride's here. The father is here. And the groom is here. Then we enter into kind of a welcome prayer kind of moment. And then there are what's called in the ceremony questions of intent. The questions of intent are, think about this if you've never thought deeply about it. There's a reason that we do a wedding like we do. Because now we're asking the groom, and we're going to ask her as well, but we're asking the groom, what are your intentions here? What are you committing to? And they're, they're the, I, they're the uh, I will quit answer, right? Will you? And he answers, I will. Now, uh, we turn to her and, and say the same. And so the question goes something like this, will you? promise to love her. I mean, we're talking about lifelong devotion, all in commitment. Will you be there for her in every way? Will you, for the usefulness of God's kingdom, will you encourage her and bless her and through, through sickness and in health? And it ends like this, as long as you both shall live for life. And then he says, he better say, I will. Then we do the same for her. And she says, I will. And then having heard that, now I've, I have done this now as a father. Having heard that, I turn to the dad and say, who gives this woman to be married to this man? Having heard the intentions, are you okay with this? Are you in on this? And he says, what? Her mother and I. And then he kisses his bride and uh, he, his daughter, and then he steps over and has a seat with the mother of the bride. Those two then are drawn together, and then we move up to the upper platform. There's symbolism there as well. Now we're starting a new family. And out of that then, that kind of covenant relationship and commitment, the I, the, the I will devotion to one another, then ultimately those two get married, become one, and they then start their own family, right? Often, not always, but often children are born out of that. When I was a little kid, I used to think, true story, that if a man and a woman, a husband and wife, loved each other enough, then like a baby would be born. <laughs> like, like there was this, you know, love meter, you know, it got to a point where, bam, baby, here comes baby. <laughs> and um, I know better now. <laughs> but I used to think that's how it worked. Like, wow, this is awesome. Out of love, a, a baby was born. 
out of love, this covenantal love, a family was born. And today I want to talk about how, listen to this, out of love, a church is born. A church is birth out of the love that Christ has given to us, what we've sung about today. And so as we wrap up this series, today is really a day where I'm going to challenge you to enter into vows before the Lord and with each other. You know, it's good every now and then to pause for a moment and have kind of the old Vince Lombardi, you know, this is a football speech as we move into football season. Um, This is a church. This is what we're about, and this is what we do specifically. So uh, here, if you are a guest, I want you to know you... You've come on a great day because today we're going to talk about really what we're all about as a church. And we're going to really be challenged today. I want to challenge you to commit to devote your lives uh, to the church and, and frankly, to this church. Now, if God's not, I tell people all the time, wrestling or I'm talking to people who are thinking about joining. I told a man uh, last week, I was uh, at coffee with him. I said, listen, at the end of the conversation, If God's calling you to join this church and be a part of this fellowship, you better obey him. If he's not, don't. Find a church where you can fully devote yourself and plug yourself into that church. Because today, here's really the point of the message. If you're devoted to follow Jesus every day, that's what we've been talking about all month long, you need to devote yourself to worship, connect, serve, and multiply going to unpack this as we move forward, okay? Colossians 3.17 has been the theme verse of our series. Let's all say this together, all right? Let's say it as, as we proclaim together. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. All right, that was that was okay. But anyway, uh, through, our, through our commitment to him, we're devoted to these things. We, we've said, in my home first, in, in my work, and we said in, in school. And today we're going to talk about uh, in the church, captured by his love, we said. We follow Jesus every day with everything we, we do, everything we say, everything. So I want you to turn to Colossians 4. We've been in the latter part of Colossians 3, entering into Colossians 4. So go ahead and turn there. In your Bible, what we're going to do is look at what Paul's been saying all along, because he's unpacked this for us, each of these different, really, domains of our lives or culture. And today we're going to look at the church, and we're going to jump from here uh, to another passage. So I hope you have your Bible with you. Colossians uh, 4, and we're going to look at verses 2 through 4. Now, often we'll put a verse or a passage on the screen. I'm going to do that today. But this should not hinder you from bringing your Bible Uh, Particularly if you're in a connect group uh, Bible study, I hope that you bring your Bible. All right, Colossians 4. So look at what it says, chapter 4, verse 2. Continually, continue steadfastly in prayer. This is the ESV. The word here is in the Greek is proskartereo. Hang on to that word. Um, It means passionately devote yourself to. Now this is in the imperative. Continue steadfastly. Be passionately devoted to prayer. All right. Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Now, what does it mean to be watchful in prayer? It means to be looking. When you pray, you pray and you say, Lord, Lord, move among us. Do this or that. And pray according to his word, according to his will. And then you watch for it. You're watchful seeing what's he going to do. This is awesome. This is going to happen. Watch this. He's going to do something because I'm praying about this. You're watchful in prayer. And you're always thankful. Prayer is always a response and thanksgiving to him for what he's already done. At the same time, pray also for us. This is Paul saying that God may open to us a door. So this is how we would say a door of opportunity, a door for the word. So he's not, he's not saying, you know, anything for me, but for the gospel to advance, to declare the mystery of Christ. That's what he means. On account of which I am in prison. He's in prison writing this on account of sharing the gospel. Notice he doesn't say, and please pray, pray, pray that I get the heck out of here, out of the jail. He's saying, no, no, I want the gospel to be advanced in every way. God has me here, and wherever he has me, let's pray that the gospel will be advanced, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. He's praying for gospel advancement regardless of what's happening. Now, Paul has been teaching about the love of Christ, but what does this look like corporately? You know, this past week, we talked about it last week a little bit, and now we've seen kind of repercussions of it. 
um, what went down in Charlottesville a week ago or so. And what we saw there was, was bigotry, racism among white supremacist nationalists. You could say this, we saw hate in mob form. Some of us, all of us, I hope, were shocked, could not believe we've got young white men, primarily, carrying torches. And if you're even not old enough, you've seen images. I mean, they're hearkening back to, they are seeking to display, if you will, the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. And we saw hate in mob form. And this caused me to think, what does love in mob form look like? What does that look like? Because that's what the world needs. Love in mob form, and I thought, that's a church. That's what that is. Love in mob form. Lives individually changed by the love of Christ. And wouldn't it be cool if we had a picture of that? Now I could say, well, um, look around. Look. And all that you've seen today through our, our video and celebration of the summer, you're like, yes, that's love in mob form. That's the church. But wouldn't it be cool if we had a picture and we could say, there's a snapshot of it, okay? How awesome is this? We have one. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2, okay? Turn to Acts 2. If you've been in the church much or even here much, you may know this passage, but I want you to turn to Acts 2. We're going to look at 41 through 47, and I'm going to walk us through, really, um, covenantal vows together. And I don't, I don't want us to play games this morning. I want you to know that God is in our midst. His Spirit is among us, and I'm going to challenge you to commit on this launch Sunday to commit perhaps as you never have before. Some of you are here and you've been casually coming to church, frankly. Some of you are not yet members of our church. And I'm just going to speak boldly about that today. I'm thinking, what are you waiting for? And I'm going to challenge you yet again, you know, to commit as you would in a marriage, to commit to his church. You know, it talks about the church being the bride of Christ, Christ the groom. There's this marriage that takes place, us and Jesus. Our commitment is primarily to him. So Jesus has lived the perfect life at this point here in Acts 2. Uh, he's died on the cross. He's resurrected. Before he ascends, he gives the mission of the church. He's given it in, in Matthew 28. He gives it in Acts 1.8, which is a verse that's very familiar to many of us. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now, why, why Jerusalem? Well, that's where they were. So there's this, um, you know, concentric circles, if you will, of advancement of the gospel. It's centrifugal, this force. We are, in that scenario, we are the ends of the earth. Uh, the gospel has come to us, all the way to us. But I want you to notice the mission comes before the church. And the spirit comes before the church. In the earlier part of Acts 2, placing this passage we're going to look at in context, the Spirit comes, Holy Spirit, and it says, as fire comes down on every believer. So think about that. I wonder what your expectations are when you come into church, even this morning. Uh, if you just came in and, man, I hope, I hope they do a good song today. I hope it's awesome. I hope the sermon's on point. And uh, let's see how this goes. I hope it's a good morning. Uh, need some coffee. All right, let's get this going. You know, and we come often casually, but I wonder if you realize what's happening when we gather. When the early church gathered, and particularly at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell on the people as fire, a flame over every head. Now, what's going on there? Well, we could talk a long time about what's happening there, but at least this, the Spirit of God now resides, not in the temple. The Spirit of God, and not, watch this, resides in the person of Jesus Christ, the incarnation. Now the Spirit of God resides on every believer, every person in here. You probably sensed it. You don't know what, how to put words to it. When we're together and we start to sing, we're exalting Christ. We, we lift him up together. Love in mob form, exalting the one who's loved us. I mean, we are, listen, can I say it? We're lit is what's happening. We are on fire. And when you take, how about this, a torch and you're off by yourself or a little flame, that's one thing. I could say it this way. All of us are disciples if you've received Christ. But together we're a church. And when believers come together, we are on fire. 
and the light shines brightly. And that's what worship is about. And so that's what happens every time we gather. You sensed it. You felt it. So look at what happens, how all of this began in the book of Acts. All right, so we're going to talk about everyday Jesus. But look at what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 41 says, So those who received his word, all right, so this is, the, this is Peter's message to, to repent and be, be baptized, to get saved. It says, So those who received his word were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves. Here's that word again. The word Paul uses. Very rare is, is this word found. New Testament. Proskartoreo. Passionately devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. There's four things specifically here. Apostle teaching and to the fellowship. No, no, the fellowship. To the breaking of bread and to the prayers. All right? Notice the article there. Specific, intentional prayers and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. I wonder if we've lost awe and wonder. You know, we watch and see the summer by numbers or all that God's done or hear stories from Rwanda or Guatemala or Vickery or South Texas. I wonder if we go, oh yeah, cool, that, that's awesome. Two young boys give their lives to Christ and we watch them baptized this morning. Are we in awe and wonder over that? That the trajectory of their lives have been completely changed? Or do we go, cool, baptism. What's the next song? What, what are we doing here? What's up next? We've lost the awe and wonder of God and what he's doing among us. It's incredible. And all came on every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Look at verse 44. And all who believed were together. That's the word we start to see now. And had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the, the proceeds to all. They were sharing. They were generous as anyone had need. And day by day, attending the temple together. Now, why were they going to the temple? Not because the, the presence of God resided there anymore. Because that's where they gathered. That was their pattern. And so they said, let's, let's, let's just gather there together, it says. And breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people, all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Is that awesome? This is the church, so let's talk about it. I want to break it down, and again, uh, just to be real clear about how we do this here, um, we believe that this passage drives us in everything we do. A church that functions like this church in Acts 2 is a biblically functioning church, and so churches do it differently, but here in our church, and I want to challenge you to commit uh, yourself to these things. So I've got some will you questions for you to covenant and agree before the Lord and each other. The first one is, will you worship? See, all of this describes how they came together. Paul encourages the church. He commands it to be devoted to prayer, to pray together. And the question that I want to ask is, what, you know, w will you commit to corporate worship? Here's a question that we've been asking in this kind of worship task force. We've been doing a lot of um, thinking and praying about our services. A question that's worth thinking about is, what do you do in corporate worship that you don't do anywhere else? I think we need to be real clear about this because a lot of us aren't as devoted to corporate worship as we once were or perhaps as we should be. Friend, I'm telling you, as a believer, you ought to be here every week. It should be the priority moment in your life. And not, I'm not simply saying this as your pastor. I'm saying this as a believer. What do you do? You cannot pray together if you're isolated alone. There's one thing you can't do, and prayer saturates our services. Tonight, we're going to come together and pray. I'm calling our church to prayer tonight at six o'clock right here. And if you can't come, school's starting tomorrow, maybe for some of you or families. Um, if you can't come, we have a guide for you that you can pick up. And uh, we have them out here in the commons, and you can get them uh, I think in your connect groups perhaps, but uh, make sure you get a guide for tonight's prayer time that we'll be using here in this place. You cannot pray if we do not come together. So here's what I want to ask you. I've got, I got a few questions. Will you, will you worship with prayer? We see this and it says the prayers. They were very specific. Um, you, could, you, could, you could challenge 
uh, any one of us or the church. If we don't pray together when we're together, are we really a church? Jesus said, my house shall be called the house of prayer, Matthew 21, 13. If we don't pray, we're, I could argue we're not a biblically functioning church. Claiming that Christ is the head, that we, we turn to him always in everything. Will you worship with prayer? The next we see here, will you worship with the speaking and hearing of the word? They devoted themselves to the apostle's teaching, which is what we're doing right now. It is in corporate worship that we're brought before the word of God. And you've seen it here as well. Uh, our worship leaders are very, very clear. The spoken, the preached uh, word of God saturates our services because it is his truth that changes our lives. Again, have we lost awe and wonder and the power of God's word to change us when we see it, when we read it? Will you worship him with the ordinances? It's the third one. I want you to think about this for a moment. Do you know what else you can't do anywhere else in the world? You can't come together and watch a baptism like you did today. There's a reason that we don't do this off somewhere in a closet or something. Uh, you, you're not baptized in isolation. That's called a bath, I think is what that is. Um, you don't do that alone. You do it in the body, right? Baptism is a critical moment in the life of a believer, and we should all celebrate it. It's why we go nuts when somebody's baptized. Baptism is the initiation uh, of membership into the community of faith. Baptism is the moment you say, I do, to the Lord in front of witnesses. It's a key moment. Not for salvation. It's always, listen, it's always believer's baptism. Two things. You never see baptism in Scripture, in the New Testament, that's not believer's baptism. In other words, you first believe, you made a decision, you're old enough to grasp and understand, and then you're, you're baptized. And you don't see infant baptism in Scripture. And if some of you, you struggle with that and go, oh, I've been baptized, I would challenge you to be baptized if you're baptized as a believer. I, cha- I mean, as a child, I challenge you to be baptized as a believer. Why wouldn't you proclaim to the world what Christ has done for you? That's what baptism is. And what you, how you've responded. I've died to myself as Christ died. I'm raised again, forgiven to live for him just as Christ died for me and was raised again. My life becomes gospel uh, reenactment. It, it, it shows everybody what's happened. You know, an unbaptized believer would have been a foreign concept in the New Testament. Unimaginable. And if you're here today and you've not been baptized, that's your challenge today. Will you be baptized? Will you? Today's your day. Make the decision. In fact, we have coming up on September 10th, we're going to celebrate baptisms, outdoor baptism. If you want to be part of that, you can get baptized any Sunday. But I want to challenge you, if you've not been baptized, to join us outside for a great day of celebration on Vision Sunday, September 10th. You can sign up today. You can come and talk with someone after this service and say, I'm, I'm going to be baptized. You know, an unbaptized believer is like, like an uncooked steak. You're not good for much. I mean, sorry. You're not, you're not done yet. And, and, and you need to follow. Why would you do this? Because God has commanded you to do so. To be baptized. And you can be a part of this great celebration. You know, another of the ordinances that we practice at the Baptist church, because we believe the Lord's given these to us, baptism and the Lord's Supper, communion together, uh, the Lord's Supper. Theologian Daniel Block, he's an Old Testament professor uh, at Wheaton. He said this, no act of corporate worship is more important than communion at the Lord's table. And he goes on to say, the New Testament offers few prescriptions for corporate worship. It does not tell us to meet on Sunday mornings. Now, we do that because of the resurrection. That's the day of celebration and new life. It doesn't say that we begin our services with song. It doesn't say we listen to a 30-minute sermon or pass around the offering plate. However, it does prescribe that believers regularly participate in the Lord's Supper, which is something in the days to come we're going to be doing on a more frequent basis. It's a highlight in the life of a church, and it's for believers only, just like baptism. Because, you see, we're celebrating what Christ has done in very tangible, tactile ways. And we do it together. 
It's so important for us to commit to being here. Like baptism, it's a defining moment in a Christian community. And I want to say this a word to parents. Parents, parent, get your kids here. It's not an option if kids are living under your roof. If you're parenting, if you're leading spiritually, you say, well, I'm not sure my kids get so much out of it every time. Listen, listen. It's like a meal. You know, you may eat a meal and go, that was okay. Or family dinner together. Well, nothing real awesome happened. In fact, we kind of got in an argument, pretty much what happened. But listen, over time, (laughs) here's what happens. Over time, you go, praise God, how we've been doing this regularly. And God has spoken into our lives. And even young children, listen, we have, we have a, you know, a connect group and care Sunday school for children during this time so that you can be focused if you'd prefer that. But I tell you what, your children are picking up a lot more than you think they are for them to be here every single Sunday. So parents, let me challenge you in the days to come as we're talking about um, reimagining our Sunday mornings be here. Be here in worship. And devote yourself. We, you know, we worship the Lord in many different ways here. And we know we've arrived in unity as a church when we celebrate the other. Not, well, my way is better than somebody else's way. They're not a better way unless, unless it's, you know, it's in spirit and in truth. There's two types of worship in the Bible. Acceptable and unacceptable. Which has nothing to do, really, with music or form or all those kind of things. So we celebrate across the board as a church and we celebrate the diversity because the Bible, the gospel goes across cultures, musical, experience, you know, experimental boundaries. Uh, and we, we worship together. We celebrate. Don't suppress that. Celebrate it. Praise God for it. And when you enter into a new or different kind of service, celebrate it. And at the risk of tribalism, be devoted to your service. If this is yours on a regular basis, be here every week. Be with the people, maybe that you sit around. Invite people to come. Own it as your service. Be passionately devoted to it. So the question is, will you worship weekly? I want to challenge you with that. Secondly, and I'll move quicker through these next few, will you connect? We talk about connecting with one another. The believers, they, they don't just devote themselves to worship. They devote themselves to one another. It says to the fellowship. And we do this here in three ways. Our connect groups uh, exist really for three ways primarily. Will you, will you connect with God's word? First of all, it's one thing to hear a message here in the larger gathering, but we have smaller gatherings. We are passionately devoted to smaller gatherings together. And because we believe there, you, you, you're applying God's word to your place of life along with other friends who will walk with you. We connect with God's word. We connect with one another. Will you connect with, with one another in devoted friendships, care and love for each other? We're in this together. Will you connect with the mission of our church? This is where congregational life happens. The word there is, you've heard it before, koinonia. It's a passionate devotion to one another. It's, it's, it's loving each other as Christ has loved us. It's a powerful love. In fact, that word was used in marriage to talk about the devotion that a husband and wife would have. Again, like, like the Charlottesville mob of hate, this is how we become, Park City's Baptist Church becomes a mob of love. And it happens as we gather together. Will you connect with God's word, each other, and God's mission every week? Devote yourself to that group. And one of the great ways to get started, gang, and and very intentional here, very pragmatic, is for you to, if you've not yet gone to Discover Park Cities, uh, next week, August the 27th, it's an on-ramp to our connect groups. And I hope you have your your, um, bulletin today because the information is there. Uh, You can find all about the church and how to get plugged in. If you're not yet plugged in or a member, you need to go to that next week. Thirdly, will you serve? And there's a few ways we do this. Will you serve in the church? Again, we, we all have a place to serve. And some of you opt not for a connect group because you have fellowship and a Bible study, maybe another time, and you opt to serve. You do worship and you serve. Others may connect and serve 
Ideally, we're worshiping and connecting, and that's the way most of us are going, but many of us can serve in the church. I think there comes a point as a believer where you ought to be serving. The, the operative question for every person in our church is, if you remember, what's your ministry? You ought to be able to answer that. What's your ministry? You serve in the church. We, you, you see the response here, sharing and giving. We serve in the city. Some of you are here. We had a few hundred of us. It's on the cover of your bulletin uh, this week. In this room a week ago, Wednesday, we were here uh, together as a church, pulling together resources, backpacks, all kinds of stuff, uh, writing letters, praying for Jack Lowe Elementary, a school over in, in Vickery that we've adopted. And it was incredible to see the principal and the assistant principal, Cecilia Barros and uh, Sandra Barrios were here sharing and through tears talking about we were an answer to prayer. And they're overwhelmed by the love and support that they're receiving. And if you're a teacher, you understand that. So we have an opportunity. Uh, Justin mentioned the, the, the serve card that you have there. I want you to take that and be prayerful about that. You can give it to an usher today or you can call uh, a specific divisional ministry and get involved. Every one of us can serve. And maybe that's what you need to do in this season. So will you serve uh, in, in the church, in the city? And will you serve in the world? Will you serve our mission trips? You know, maybe this is the year that you go. You finally go and say, I, I've been thinking about this. That would be awesome. We have entry level kind of, if you will, for, with families, you know, in South Texas to go. This could be the year. Commit to it. Devote yourself to it. And then finally, will you multiply? Verse 47, the Lord added to their number daily. Now you can say, well, that's addition, not multiplication. But listen, the whole church existed to make disciples. That's why we exist. And every disciple is a disciple maker. Here's the question there. Who, whom are you discipling? Who are you specifically pouring your life into? The question is, will you multiply as a lifestyle? As a lifestyle, ongoing, always looking to disciple someone, always a succession plan in your, in your area of ministry to say, who am I bringing up? Who am I raising up? Our devotion to the church, friends, listen, you've heard, is not casual. It is a passionate devotion. Like marriage, we devote ourselves to Christ, to one another, and to his church. So, I want to land this with a challenge. As we think about following Jesus every day. Every day, Jesus. Questions of intent. And I don't want you to enter into this casually. Many of you can answer these questions, but I want to challenge all of us with the I will answer. All right? So if you can, I want you to answer, I will, as we devote ourselves to these things. First, will you worship weekly? Let's do that again. Will you worship weekly? All right. Will you connect weekly? Will you serve regularly? Will you multiply as a lifestyle. Praise be to God. Now let's act on what we have committed before the Lord. This is not for me. It is, yes, for him, before him, in response to what he's done. And it's for one another. And so here it is. If you are devoted to follow Jesus every day, you need to devote yourself to worship, connect, serve, and multiply. I say it often. Listen, this is for some of us here. Today's the day. You didn't come here anticipating the Spirit's moved in your life. Stop dating the church. Commit your life to His church. God's calling you to do so. Join the church today. Commit to being baptized. So love in mob form looks like a church. But we know the original prototype was Christ Himself. The body of Christ, the visible body of Christ today is the church. But he's the prototype, the body of Christ given for us on the cross. His blood shed for you, his body broken so that you would be forgiven and you would give your life to him in response and not do it alone, but do it in a community of people devoted to one another, devoted to him. 
So let's close our time in prayer. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes with me. I want you to devote yourself to him anew. We're going to wrap up with just prayer together as we close our time. So the Spirit has spoken into your heart. Some of you need to act, like right away. So if you need to receive Christ, you've not yet received His grace, that's your first step. It's all born out of that. If you've not received Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to say yes to Him today. Say, Lord, come into my heart and make me the person that you have created me to be. Give your heart to Him. Devote yourself to Him. And if you... If you have done so, then have you joined the fellowship of the church? And even before that, have you, have you been baptized? And if not, why not? And what are you waiting for? Let the Spirit convict you and then obey. And then to join the church. Become a member. A covenant member of this congregation. And enter into a relationship with others through your connect group. Get in a group. You desperately need it. And your life, your spiritual life will soar as you enter into commitment with other believers. So Lord, we give you our lives. We thank you for your grace. We love you and we love your church. We commit ourselves to her to each other. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.